Well, good morning, Oak Mountain. Good to be with you. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn in to 2 Timothy 3. That's where we're going to be today. We're going to be continuing the series in 2 Timothy we've been looking at and studying together so far this year. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. We've seen many themes that have come up as we've studied this passage together. And we're going to look at chapter 3 today. And one of the major themes we've been looking at from 2 Timothy that Paul has been telling to Timothy is running the race to the end. Running the race. We've seen different themes with that of running the race with focus and running the race with friends and not being alone. And today we're going to look at another aspect of what it means to run the race with perseverance. And that would be running the race with wisdom. It's going to take wisdom in order to make it to the end, to persevere, to run the race all the way to the end. It's not just we wake up one day and we run a marathon or we uh, fight in a heavyweight boxing match type of thing. There's training, there's preparation involved. And as I was studying this passage, it reminded me of, of a significant sports event that happened almost exactly 30 years ago. I didn't even know it was going to be the case. But some of y'all remember this picture, February 11th. So we're two days away from 30 years ago, which, man, I, I thought it was 20, but it's actually 30 years ago. Mike Tyson fought Buster Douglas, and it was the shock of the world title match. It's been claimed to be the, the most shocking um, underdog story in boxing history. And as many of you know, Mike Tyson, he came into this match with Buster Douglas, undefeated, undisputed heavyweight champion in boxing. He owned all three title belts. No one had beat him. It wasn't a matter of if he was going to win. It was just a matter of how soon he was going to knock you out. I mean, this is what he did. He was so famous, he had the Nintendo game, Mike Tyson's Punch-Out. Some of you played it. Up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, B-A-B-A, -B -A, start. Some of you know what I'm talking about? Yep. That's a cheat code if you don't know. Played it too much, probably. But anyway, Mike Tyson was so well known. He was iron to Mike Tyson. He intimidated everybody that he fought against. This is just who he was. And this match against Buster Douglas was supposed to be a warm-up match for him to fight Evander Holyfield. And so instead, he didn't train well. He fired his trainer. As we say in the South, he got a little too big for his britches. He wanted to go his own way, do his own thing, and he partied a lot. He didn't respect his opponent, obviously. But then Buster Douglas, on the other hand, relatively unknown guy, he won a few matches to be able to fight Mike Tyson, but 23 days before he had this match, his mother passed away, and he was already training as if his life depended on it, and that gave him just that much more umph to want to fight for something. And as we know from this picture here, he actually knocked out Mike Tyson in the ninth round. He went toe-to-toe -to -toe with a guy that had never been knocked down before, and he knocked him out. It was an unbelievable match. It was such an underdog uh, match that no casino would place a bet on this except one, and the odds were 42-1 to one that Buster Douglas even had a chance. They, the commentators before the match were even saying, hey, I wonder what round that Buster Douglas is going to get knocked out in. So literally, Buster Douglas shocked the world. And there's a lot to glean from this that's similar to our passage today. Mike Tyson was full of folly leading up to this match. He was not wise. Buster Douglas, he knew it was going to take a lot to make it. Mike Tyson never became the undisputed heavyweight champion ever again after this match. He tried again with Evander Holyfield and a few other times, and it never actually panned out. So Mike Tyson never actually made it and sustained it all the way through. So we're going to look at our passage today from 2 Timothy 3. So if you'll stand with me, let's read this passage together. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 13. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy. I'm, I'm going to get through it, I promise. Heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people. For among them there are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. Just as Jonas and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth, men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. But they will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all, as was that of those two men. You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, 
my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured. Yet from, the, from them all, the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people, imposters, will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Let's pray together. Father, please bless this word today. Help us to see you for who you are. I pray you would help us and strengthen us and empower us and enable us by your Holy Spirit to run the race. So please impart the wisdom that you give us in your word. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. So it's going to take wisdom to persevere and run this race until the end. Paul has imparted to Timothy words that we get a close and up, up close and personal view of. This is the one letter that, that Paul wrote that wasn't addressed to a church. It was addressed to one person, Timothy, and we get to see what he's written down. And he wants to impart the wisdom so that Timothy can run the race. And God wants us to have this so that we can run the race as well. So I believe there's at least three things that God is showing us that Paul is talking about here that we can glean from this passage. The first one we're going to look at is, number one, expect a battle. Expect a battle. Expect a fight. There is an opponent. There is evil. And it works against you and me as believers and against God and his kingdom and his purposes. It's just the way it is. There is a battle that we have to fight as believers. As Bob has talked about before, when we become believers, we become enlisted. It's just going to happen. He starts off this very chapter saying, you need to understand this, Timothy. It will be wise for you to hear what I'm having to say. He talks about last days, by the way. When he says that, it's not just something that's a prophecy that never made it. Last days is just the time between when Jesus rose again from the dead until when he has his second coming. All of that time in between is the last days. So just like the early church to now, we live in the last days until Jesus returns. We live in a time that Paul is describing to Timothy that we can see how people live. In this list, it's very long. It's very negative. It's exhausting just to read the list. There's so many words to describe what this looks like. But Paul is saying, Timothy, I want you to be forewarned so you can be forearmed. I want you to know what it looks like, that there's people that are here in the church, the greater church, that may not actually be one of us. Bob last week talked about the visible and the invisible church. The visible church is just the gathering of all people to worship the Lord. The invisible church is something that only God can see that are actually his truly elect and saved and redeemed and ransomed people that he has drawn into a relationship with himself and have become united with Christ. That is the invisible church. And Paul's saying here, Timothy, there are people that will be in your church that really don't know Christ. And we can know it by the pattern of their lives. Now, there's one way to read this list and go, oh, this can be really like a camp, like very tribal. Oh, well, that's the us versus them. Well, I'm not them. But hang on. Let's be careful. Jesus talked about the Pharisee and the tax collector. The Pharisee went to the temple to pray, and he said, I pray, I tithe, I do a lot of things that are really good, and thank you that I'm not like this guy. And Jesus said, but you know what? The tax collector went to the temple and beat his chest and said, have mercy on me, Lord. And he's the one who went home justified. And so as we read this list, we have to be careful and also know that James 1 says that his word is like a mirror. And as we read it, we hold it up and we're able to see ourselves for who we truly are face to face. So yes, there are people in the visible church that may do these things that might be more the pattern of their life. But as believers, it's not the pattern of our life, but there are still things that we can see that we might need to repent of. Personally, for me, this week, as I study this passage, I didn't put it together at first. But thankfully, for my wife and my family, I started to see, you know what? I've been a bear this week. I would call it being a bear. I'd call it being a grouch. But God calls it unappeasable. That hit home a lot harder for me. I've been unappeasable to my own family. I've been hard to get along with. And God used that. He uses his word to expose to me, and he'll expose things to you and reveal things for us as believers that we might be able to repent of and believe the good news of the gospel, that his grace is sufficient and forgives us of these sins, and by the power of his Holy Spirit enables us to fight against that sin. I don't want to be grouchy. 
I don't want to be unappeasable. And now that I see it, I want to fight against it and I can love my family well. So what are the things on this list that, that might be things that we might need to see, that the Lord might need to reveal to us, that we can repent of and believe the good news of the gospel? He goes a little bit further here in verse 13, and he calls these people evil and imposters because this is the pattern of their life. He's saying they're not really of us. First John, uh, John talks about these same type of people in chapter 2 is saying that even though they were among us, they were not of us. Even though they were around us doesn't really mean they're Christians. And it's a good word for us being in the South and the buckle of the Bible Belt that so many people claim to be Christians, and yet we know not everyone is a Christian. And it's not a self-proclamation that I'm a Christian. It's not about walking the aisle, praying the prayer, having the religious experience. All those things do not make us a Christian. Non-Christians can literally do those things. It takes the power and the work of the Holy Spirit to regenerate our hearts and change us and call us to himself and put his Holy Spirit inside of us. You cannot do that. I cannot do that. That is the impossible miracle of what it means to be saved that God draws you himself into a relationship with you, with him. And so it's not a self-proclamation of being a Christian. And if that has happened in your life, your life will begin to change. You will desire to live a godly life. You will want to pursue holiness, not so God will love you more, but because your desires begin to change from the inside out, and you just want to please God. You want to love him because he loved you first, that while you were still a sinner, Christ died for you. He showed you his love for you in that. And so we, we know this, and yet these people are deceptive in the church. There's ways that people deceive. The pattern of their life takes on one that says they're a Christian, but they're not. And this reminds me of something I've come across recently that you might have heard about. It's called the truth default theory. The truth default theory is actually a phrase coined by a professor in town at UAB. But it was picked up by Malcolm Gladwell that you might know. That's a famous author. He's written several books. His latest book is called Talking with Strangers. In this book, Talking with Strangers, he talks about this term, the truth default theory. And in the truth default theory, basically what it means is that we as people generally accept what people say to us as true. It helps give us efficient communication. We can understand each other quicker. But the flip side of it is it exposes us to deceit, or at least occasional deceit. And Malcolm Gladwell takes this and talks about it, and he gives example after example in history where people have been duped over time. He talks about someone called the Queen of, uh, the Queen of Cuba who uh, went to work in the CIA and moved her way up, high up into the CIA, in the Central Intelligence Agency, and yet no one knew that she was a spy for Cuba, constantly giving away secrets to Cuba. Matter of fact, when they find out, found out who she was, they found out she had an entire network that the U.S. thought was spies for them in Cuba. They were actually spying for her to help Cuba out, and they were duped along the whole way. And we can be duped in many ways like that too. And there's people that love to exploit that and use that for their advantages. And so because we can expect a fight, Timothy could too, what do we do? We arm ourselves with God's word. The only way we're going to know if we're being deceived is if the more familiar we are with God's word. God gives us his word so we can know what is true. And the more we study it and we meditate on it, we, we talk about it. Um, And we're preaching through it verse by verse. We'll begin to see more and more and more and be more familiar with God's truth, his word, and the gospel itself. You know when you just hear someone say something sometimes, "Uh, I just don't, that's not really true. No, it's not. And sometimes you can talk to them about it, and sometimes it's not appropriate. But the more familiar you are with God's word, the more you'll be able to discern lies from the truth. And so as we experience this fight, it comes along with some effects to us. Um, There are effects that happen from this battle, which leads us to our second point. And the second one is we can expect some pain. There's always pain that comes from fighting and from battle. Paul talks about pain happening at least two ways here, persecutions and sufferings. Verses 11 and 12, he's talking about it specifically, and he says that those who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And I'm sorry, guys, but it is, it's a promise, period. It, just, it is what it is. He didn't beat around the bush about it. He went straight for it and said, as God gives you the desire to live a godly life, there's going to be pushback. So your life and my life as a believer, there will be times in our life we're experiencing pushback from people or groups of people or a person, sometimes little, sometimes a lot. 
And we need to expect that. It's just what's going to happen. That's part of the dynamic of being a Christian. But why is that? And what do we do about that? Well, first of all, it's good to know 1 Corinthians 1.18. 118 says that the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but it's the power of God for those who are being saved by it. You might remember if you were here earlier in the year, in uh, chapter 1 of 2 Timothy, verse 7, it says, For God did not give us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and of love and self-discipline. And that's what we're talking about here. There is a power of the message of the cross that's keeping us and preserving us and helping us run the race to the end. And yet that same message of the cross of Jesus dying for our sins is foolishness to other people. And we need to be reminded that it's not us that are offensive as Christians. It's not that we're coming across the wrong way. We just need to know that the gospel itself can be divisive and everything hinges on Christ himself. There's times where I have shrunk back from not wanting to share the gospel because I don't want to offend someone. And then I regret those times. I didn't even, I'm the one discriminating when the gospel goes forth. Tim Keller talks about it this way, that there should be at least some people in your life that are being drawn to Christ because you live a godly life and you share the gospel. And there should also be some people that are being pushed away, not because you're offensive and arrogant, because the message of the cross does that. So some of us may have pushed everybody away. (laughs) And I would say you need to remember Paul's other words where he says, I become all things to all men so that I might win a few. Paul wants to be winsome. And we might need to know that. We need to be winsome with our words about the message of the cross. On the other hand, living in the South, maybe everybody likes us because we're a Christian. That's all I have is friends who are Christians. Well, I would say that you might need to be a little bit more bold in sharing the gospel. Spiritual things, talking about those things with other people, taking the opportunities to talk about Christ. It is okay to do that. So who do you notice in your life that's running from grace or is being drawn into grace? Who are those people in your life? How are your conversations and how can you cause and make your conversations to be even more seasoned with grace so that people have the opportunity to be drawn in or to have to wrestle with Christ and maybe run away? It's not you, it's the message of the cross itself. And how does it feel to help connect people to the Lord? Maybe for the first time, maybe in a new or deeper or fuller, richer way. How does that feel that the Lord uses you to do that? The second part of the pain that we experience is just through sufferings and hardships. And the quick word I want to say about that is this, this very prevailing, if not the most prevailing view of God in our culture right now which is called the moralistic therapeutic deism. It's a crazy term. We don't throw that around the dinner table at all. But it's based on a lot of research of asking people, hey, how do you see God? And how would you describe your relationship with God? And based on all that information, they've coined this phrase, moralistic therapeutic deism. Moralistic means that most people, or generally a lot of people in our culture, believe that God wants you to be a good moral person. Secondly, People believe that God, as far as the therapeutic, means that God ultimately wants me to be happy with my life, to be happy about everything. And then thirdly, deistic, meaning that God has set things in motion like a watchmaker that set it in motion, now he's distant and he's uninvolved. And that is a hugely predominant view in America. A lot of people view God that way. And it flies in the face of of Scripture, And if we just know the word, if we're exposed to it and study it, we'll see that can't be true of who God is and his character. God's not a killjoy. Paul here is not trying to be a killjoy to to Timothy, but he wants his eyes to be wide open to run the race. You've got to understand this as it begins this chapter. There will be times of difficulty. He's saying it out of love. He's saying it to give you a heads up about what's going to happen in life. This life is going to be hard. It's not a killjoy statement. There actually will be a deeper contentment and joy as you know what's your face in the, ahead. <clears throat> this moralistic therapeutic deism has ways in which it expresses itself. And I may step on some toes when I say this. So I'm, I'm sorry ahead of time. It's not personal. But there's this slogan and phrase that keeps coming up more and more and more. And it's living your best life now. So some of you, you might like that phrase. So it's, again, it's not personal. But living your best life now I don't like that phrase. 
I have a hard time with it. And the reason I do is because every time I've seen someone say that or use that, I, literally every time, it's been a license to just narcissism, and selfishness, and indulgence. And hey, I'm going to get mine while I can. And that is not what God's called us to at all. He's called us to a life of sacrifice that would be hard. Now, again, I'm not saying God doesn't want us to be happy and he doesn't want us to be joyful and content. But he's saying there's much more than that. There's got to be more than just what's happening in this life right now. God calls us to this this life of death. and, And it goes against the grain of living your best life now. In fact, as staff, we're reading a book right now called The J-Curve. It's a book written by Paul Miller, and it's based upon the shape of the letter J and that it starts out by going down for us, our life as a Christian. It's a life that's going downward, and it's a life of death. It's a life of sacrifice, of dying to yourself. But on coming up on the other side of the J is the promise of life and resurrection, And the ways he described it, going from dying to rising, is going from powerlessness to power. Going from narrowing to widening. Going from constriction to expansion. And going from shame to glory. That is the Christian life. We're going to taste death a lot in our life. And yet the resurrection on the other side of these little mini deaths that are happening in our life leads to life as we never would have experienced it before. <clears throat> These little pictures of Jesus that are happening, we're experiencing all the time. So what are some instances in your life where you feel like it's death to do it, and yet you know as you give up your own rights and consider others' interests more important than your own, it leads to more life and your family and your marriage at work. What are the ways in which God may be calling you to do that? And so as we experience this battle, and we taste the effects of that with just pain, it leads us and drives us to our need of our third point today, which is we need to prepare through discipleship. Prepare through discipleship. Verses 10 and 11, if you want to know, if you haven't been discipled before or disciple someone, verses 10 and 11 are some great elements of what discipleship are. Again, this whole book was written from Paul to Timothy an up-close personal look at what discipleship is. This whole book is discipleship. But these verses specifically, we can see that the only way that Timothy would know about his love, his steadfastness, his joy, his endurance, all of these things could be an up-close and personal walk with Paul. It's the only way he could know it. You can't know those things from a distance. And I think it's a good word for us. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11.1, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Because he's focused on Christ, and he's bringing others alongside of him to do life, and it's helpful. And if those, who are more, those who are more mature in Christ, we need to avail ourselves to disciple and mentor others uh, in the church. That is, we're not made to do this alone. He's given us the community, the body, to work together, to build each other up in Ephesians 4, to build each other up to maturity in Christ together. And that is what... Timothy and Paul are are showing us here. You know, nestled in verse 11, it's just kind of nestled in there at the very end. It says, yet from all them the Lord has rescued me. Here's Paul, further ahead in life, telling Timothy, hey, here's what's coming ahead. Here's some wisdom I want to impart to you. And just know of all the bad stuff that you've seen that's happened in my life, the good, bad, and the ugly, the Lord has rescued uh, rescued me from all of it. Now, I want to be clear. This is not health, wealth, and prosperity of him saying, hey, I made out of everything, and so will you. He's not saying I rescued out of everything, and so no matter what's happening hard in your life, God's going to take care of all of it. I don't know the answer to that. God does not make that clear on each of us specifically. But what we do know, when he's saying he's rescued us, he's saying that the worst circumstance that could have happened is you could be sent to hell for your sins, and Jesus has ransomed your life and bought you at a price and redeemed you and called you his own, and he has rescued you. So no matter what the circumstance is, you are rescued. And that is good news for us. He will preserve us and sustain us and help us to carry on until the end and to run this race. So how can we avail ourselves to mentor and disciple other people? Life is messy. Life is chaotic. Life is hard. Yet we need to avail ourselves. And, and here's part of the secret is we never have it all together. <clears throat> we think if we 
There are a lot of times we can think we need to kind of get things together, make our house look good before we have people over or, you know, get, dot all our I's and cross all our T's before we can spend time with people. But you know what? I can't think of any instances in my life where people have discipled me or I've reached out to them. Seeing the messiness of their life has taught me so much. Like watching people fumble through figuring out their finances or figuring out what it means to be a godly businessman, those things have been helpful for me to see. They've encouraged me to know that I'm not alone. They've shown me practical ways to pray and how to share my faith, how to, how to be a godly husband or a godly parent. They've given me models for these things because I wonder how it can look. <clears throat> it reminds me of a, an article I came across. New York Times said that sometimes astronomical advantages that children of famous and powerful parents have over those with less distinguished parents, it's, it's astronomical. The sons of senators, for instance, were roughly 8,500 times more likely to become a senator than the average American man. Sons of famous CEOs and Pulitzer Surprise winners had similarly outlandish edges over their non-famous competition. <clears throat> How exactly are these job inheritance patterns perpetuated? One answer, household culture. An auto mechanic will instill different interests in her children than will an architect. And a child exposed to, say, tinkering might be more prone to spending time in the garage than at a drafting table. In the aftermath of the World Trade Center collapse, we can imagine the engineer's family talked mainly about why the building failed structurally, whereas the sociologist family talked mainly about why there is terrorism. Generational torch passing takes place gradually and is folded into daily routines. <clears throat> it's a lot like discipleship. As we bring other people along, invite people in, even when it's messy and it's hard, that values are passed on. Wisdom is imparted the same way it is here. And Paul is passing the torch to Timothy, saying, I want to show you what this Christian life looks like, what it's like to lead a church, what it's like to be a believer, to have opposition, to fight a battle, to experience pain. And we're going to learn that through discipleship. So let us remember, in order to run this race, to persevere, God will sustain us by his Holy Spirit, and he will give us wisdom. In James 1, it says, if you lack wisdom, ask for it, and he gives it generously. And one of the major modes he does that is through discipleship. So let us expect a battle, expect there to be some pain, and train through discipleship. So with that, we're going to move now to a time of communion. So as we think about running the race and being preserved and making it to the end, this is an appropriate time to be able to break bread together. <clears throat> we are in need of the spiritual presence of Christ and his nourishment so that we might persevere to the end. While the elders are coming down, let me say this. <clears throat> that the Lord's Supper is an ordinance and a sacrament of Christ. And all of you here who profess Christ, that he is the Son of God, and if you're a member of good standing of an evangelical church, this table is for you. But this table does come with warnings. If there's sin that you need to deal with first, or yet you maybe do not know Christ yet, we want to encourage you to refrain from taking the elements right now and let them pass. If you don't know Christ, we pray that you would know Christ and take this time to consider him and who he is. And lastly, as we take this and we believe this is a sacrifice, it is, is a great demonstration of the gospel. As you're passively listening to the words as we preach and we sing songs, we are now entering a time that is participation for all of us. I mean, think about the model of what we're doing together. As the elements come to you, your hands are empty and you have nothing to offer. You're not buying this bread or purchasing it with a price, but it is being offered to you freely. And all you have to do is to receive. You can take the elements for yourself and digest the elements. And as you do, they will nourish your body and they will nourish your mind and they will also nourish your soul. We believe this is a means of grace where God's spirit is with us God is, uh, Jesus is with us spiritually in the elements, and we get to participate in this gospel act together. Let us pray.
Father, please be with us during this time. Please nourish us. Let us experience your presence here with us now. Thank you for your bread and the wine and how they provide so much more for us than just physical strength. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.